Hi, I'm John Mark Young, President and Chief Investment Officer of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers, and I'd like to welcome you to the Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers, What We Learned in the Markets This Week video. Remember, our aim is to provide you, our valued clients, with a brief video giving you information that's helpful to your understanding of the markets, while also giving it from a biblical worldview with no financial agenda, which makes us uniquely different from the news media in America. Also, thanks to a new SEC marketing rule, I must remind you that there is no return guarantee when investing. All investments are subject to risk, and of course, past performance is not indicative of future returns. So let's talk about the four things we learned in the markets this week. And point number one was for the second straight week, the markets went in the wrong direction. Don't they know they're supposed to go up, not down? It looked positive earlier in the week when inflation data came out with only a modest increase during the month of November, and that beat analysts' expectations. Uh, Tuesday morning, when the markets opened, stocks exploded because of that inflation news, but they ended the day only modestly in the green, losing a lot of their steam throughout that day. And losing that steam on Tuesday was probably a sign of things to come because Wednesday, Fed President Jerome Powell came in like a stern parent saying, this party's over, we're canceling it, everybody go home, and we're giving you more rate increases and keeping it there longer. Now, it's not necessarily the fact that they raised rates this month because this month, because everybody knew that was going to happen. However, it was the tone, just like you can feel it in the tone of your parents, or could have back in the day, higher for longer and longer and longer. He made it very clear he feels the market is too optimistic about getting back to lower rates. Now, for the week, the S&P 500, which tracks our growth and growth and in income stocks, that was down 2.08 for the week. The Russell 2000, which tracks our aggressive growth, smaller companies, was down 2.75. And finally, growth stocks in our Dave Ramsey vernacular, which is tracked by the NASDAQ, was down 2.72 percent for the week. Now, point number two, as we get ready to close the year on what quite honestly has been a awful year for the stock market, it begs the question, could anyone have seen this coming? You're probably asking that or have asked that sometime throughout this year. Now, before you answer that with the gravitas of history in the rearview mirror, let me remind you that there are folks that get paid a lot of money to predict this kind of stuff and they haven't been too awful bad at it. So if you think you're that good, go work for them because you'll make a lot of money, which is why we listen to them. Wall Street analysts have on average been a little too high on their one-year forward-looking S&P 500 year-end price targets, but it's only been about 2%. 2% high. Not bad, okay? Not bad. Check out the chart on your screen for my friends at DataTrek who supplied us with this great information. The green is when analysts were too optimistic with their year-end S&P 500 price target predictions, and the red is when they were too pessimistic. So going back to 2011, only 2% on average above S&P 500 one-year estimates, as I said. Last year, they missed the mark by 33% to the downside. The last two years have been pretty bad misses on average. Explainable in the sense that 2021 had margin expansion for companies through um, inflation and those sort of things, and that increased their earnings power. And 2022 was a multiple valuation reset to the downside, thanks to historically higher interest rates. And I mean historically higher in terms of the pace of the increases, of course, we've had, not the fact that they're historically high, because they certainly have been higher. One item to note is the current year-end price target of the S&P 500 is 4,494 for next year, and that is a 15% gain for from here. Point number three, let's talk about the worst performing tech names in the S&P 500 this year. Let's call it the minus 40 or worse club, which is, of course, hearkening back to the tech bubble in 2000, 2001, where technology stocks were routinely being cut in half, if not significantly more. Now, the winner of the 40% club, everybody's probably happy that they made it. Facebook, Meta is down 65% and they take the prize. PayPal is down 63%. Next, my guy, Elon Musk, who has watched um, his company, Tesla, drop 55% this year. One item to know in the private markets, which are, of course, non-publicly traded stocks that we can't buy yet, his company, SpaceX, 
which is again not traded uh, they can uh, they are a private company they just got another funding round and their valuation increased mightily i think close to 40 percent. so things aren't all bad for my guy elon following that is advanced micro devices they were down 53 percent Netflix fell 51% for the year, and then we get to the 40s, and I'll go in order here, and of course, these are all negative. Salesforce at 48%, Intel at 47%, Amazon at 47%, Micron, Micron at 44%, and NVIDIA at 42%. That's quite the list, and th the difference from the 2000s is most of these companies are wildly profitable, so uh, presumably, there's a bounce at some point. Point number four, let's talk about Jerome Powell's speech this week that sent the markets into a tailspin. Now, as discussed, uh, the day before inflation came in with a 0.01 increase month over month for the month of November, and that expectation was that they were going to be a 0.03 increase. So, so they beat to the, to the downside, which is good. However, at Chair Powell's press conference, he discussed goods and commodity inflation is decreasing. We're all seeing signs of that. He believes interest rates are going to do their job to slow down the housing inflation sometime next year. And that just leaves us with core services inflation we got to figure out. Now, they believe that wage inflation and the tight labor markets are the primary cult culprits to this non-housing core inflation. Just look at Friday's weekly initial unemployment claims that came in, 211,000, which is once again below the one-year average. So not a lot of job losses. Uh, at least people filing for running claim, regardless of what, what the crooked media is telling you. Uh, Powell mentioned that, in, in their view, we are about 4 million workers short right now, which has been exacerbated by accelerated retirements, and in his mind, 500,000 working age folks who unfortunately passed away because of COVID-19. Now, he wants to see the labor market return to its 2018 through 2020 levels, where labor force participation rate was rising, more people were coming into the job market, and the largest pay increases were coming at the lower end of the spectrum. People that weren't making a lot were getting the best raises. 2018 through 2020 were some great years for the stock market as well, Chair Pal. So I agree, let's get back there as soon as possible. If you enjoyed the four things we learned in the markets this week, do us a favor, help us with YouTube and Google's algorithms by smashing that like button there at the bottom. You smash that, that helps us get our content out to more people. You can also subscribe to the, the uh, YouTube channel for Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers if you like the content we create, so that way you can be informed anytime a new video hits the deck. Also, if you'd like to schedule a meeting with any of our advisors, go to the comment section where you can click on a link and schedule with any of our financial coaches who help you get out of debt, stay out of debt, live on a budget, and be that accountability partner for you, or our financial planners who will help you plan and save for retirement, as well as any other goals you have. Thanks so much. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.